Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Adam has called from Finchley. It's a good name to start with. Adam, hello. Hi, Lashina. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Yes, you're not a fan of Extinction Rebellion. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry to say I can't stand them at all. I think their practices are, yeah, very disruptive, uh, unnecessarily so. Um, I think there's better ways of putting your points across than, you know, acting like children screaming at the top of your voice and not listening to anyone else's input external to that your own group uh, to have a discussion. I mean, they're taking up valuable police time when there's serious crime going on around London, which we know knife crime is very high. There's murders, there's rapes, there's, you know, all different types of things, yet um, they're OK and happy to, you know, take, what, hundreds and hundreds of police officers' uh, time and working hours up to spend on, you know, their antics. They're stopping people uh, earning their day's wage by commuting across London if they use roads or, you know, need access to a certain route. Um, and, yeah, they just keep pushing this uh, narrative, which we already know is very important. Yet yeah, normal people like you and I probably turn up to work, we put a shift in, and we change our lifestyle on the side. I mean, I consume... Uh, a lot less meat than I used to. I don't. I use single. I, I got rid of single-use plastics, and a lot of different things in my lifestyle has changed. They can do that, but I feel like these types of people within this extinction rebellion group are afraid to work, and they are bottom feeders of society. And this is their best use of their life. The thing is, it's hard to measure where the moment comes when you change your behaviour. I've I've done some of the things that you describe as well, um, but I I would say that you know let's see what pans out over the next two weeks. But I would say that the last protests a few months ago did make me sit up and notice more thoughtfully and deeply than I had before. I turned up, I went to one of their protests, which uh, I don't know if you remember the, where they, you know, anchored a boat into Oxford. I do, the pink boat, yeah. I, I went there to see what it was all about. I turn up and it's just a couple of hippies smoking illegal drugs on the floor in tents. I mean, what's that about? What's that achieving? It's a joke. These people don't have better things to do than do what they're doing. They're just, yeah, I don't know what they're what their purpose is. That, to well, me, when I turn up thinking, well, did you speak, environmental did you, issue, and I turn up and they're doing that. Did you speak it's to funny. any of them? Um, I think a lot of them were, uh, were too gone, Sheila, unfortunately. But, Adam, you know, our reporters spent days out on the streets with them, and plenty of them were people who had full-time jobs. There were lawyers, there were teachers out there. They had full-time jobs. They had taken leave in order to do this because it matters so much to them. They are political activists. They are climate no. activists. No. And... You know, in, intelligent, smart people who've chosen this as the means to support the, the planet. Uh, you know, you and I maybe do it differently, but do we have to be so, uh, you know, you've, I don't want you to repeat it, but you've said some really unpleasant things about some of them. If they're going to be less, less disruptive, then I think people uh, who currently see them as a negative force will actually open up and actually uh, understand what they're saying is, yeah, really important and, and we need to act on. I mean, as we said, people are changing their lifestyle, but would be more receptive to if they're less disruptive. I think that's the main thing that really irritates people, the way they're going about their protest. So what what would you like to see instead? What would I like to see? Yeah. I, In what kind of pro... Because protest is, by its nature, always a bit disruptive, isn't it? Um, well, if it's organised, then it's, it's not really, because then you, everyone's got advance notice of exactly this group's No, but it is. But it is. If, you have, if you've ever driven around London at the weekend, there's always some kind of protest or other that has the full support of the law, is lightly policed, and it still closes six streets and you can't get anywhere. I've lived in London my whole life, and I've never, ever faced any issue getting around London through the roads with protests, only this one. So really? I Gosh, I, I have. Loads of times. Uh, yeah. and, and, I, and I drive, for, and I have to drive for work and different uh, means of transport. I don't use a tube, so yeah, I come into contact with the road a lot, and I've never seen anyone such as this group causing so much disruption. It's the only group I've come across, you know, sitting and camping out on roads. Why can't they do it in Hyde Park, on, on, on a green space or something like that? You know, they, they, they care about nature, etc. Why don't they be at one with nature and sit in a field or something and do it there and we'll recognise them? Don't sit on a road. <laughs>
<laughs> but the, go and sit in a field. But the roads are where half of it's happening. All those awful vehicles chugging out diesel fuel. That's their yeah, point. Yeah, we're, we're changing. Sadiq Khan's come along and he's putting, you know, ULED zones and all these different things. And, yeah. you know, that, that's improving, the, uh, you know, conditions in central London. Slowly, slowly, things will change. They can't expect things to happen overnight. That's what they want. They want an instant change. That doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean, but Adam, when you have even the chief scientist saying he's concerned about the pace of the impact of climate change, that even he hadn't expected it to be as quick as it is. You know, it's always worth listening to the to, to the protesters as well. Listen, you know, it has to be policed and you're, you're right that it is disruptive and you're right that it's annoying when it's disruptive and all of those things. But I, I think there's a place for this. I really do. Thank you, Adam, for your call. Paul has called from Zurich. Hey, how are you, Shirley? Hi, Hi, Paul. I'm fine, yes. Um, pleasure to speak to you. Absolutely wonderful. I've been listening to you for decades. You're oh. an underrated broadcaster. Am I underrated? Oh, that's important. Absolutely. Who's saying Hockney mean things? Awards. Who's saying mean <laughs> things? Tell me. I'll have them. <laughs> okay, I'm 50-50 on this, Sheila. Go on. Um, I, I admire these people. I admire the gumption. I, and 95% of people on the streets today right, think they or believe they're doing the right thing. You know what? They kind of are. However, reality bites. I've been doing some research overnight and I noticed an unfortunate and rather uh, insidious trend in the leadership and what their goals are. Have you read the demands? Go on. Well, the first one is <clears throat> tell the truth. Yeah. The second one is um, do something by 2025, which is unrealistic, uh, even with the best will. And the third one are the citizens' councils. Have you read that one? Go on. So, in some lottery system, I guess like uh, jury service, they'll select uh, 50 to 100 people from around the country, as long as it's demographic demographically representative. And these people will then be essentially um, put in charge of government policy with no argument from the government. They'll be given access to experts, whoever their experts will be. And they will discuss, uh, a la Marxist theory, uh, the best solution, and that solution will be implemented. Now, I, but but I, you know why that won't happen, don't you? Well, and and you need to stress about it, is, is that we live in a parliamentary democracy, and that isn't but how it works. But that's the, the guts of the demand of the, of, of the entire motion, of the entire movement. Now, I emailed them last night um, and asked them, or the woman in charge of, of these citizens' councils, how would you do the lottery? I mean, it, would it tr be truly random? I got a response about 20 minutes ago saying, well, we've decided not to do the random lottery stuff now. Um, we'll have certain councils decide other councils who will then decide who's in charge of these citizen councils. So it truly is um, the, the standard Marxist leftist um, politic, which is we want everyone to be the same. But by the way, we're in charge. I'm, I'm not sure how you read the we want everyone to be the same um, from what you've just well, told me. I've got it in front of me now, their strategy. <clears throat> Um, I'm not sure that, I mean, you're, there may be Marxists amongst them, I'm sure there are, um, but there may be, I don't know, there may be Tories amongst them, there may be um, apolitical people amongst them, or party, in, you know, people who aren't into in, any party. In, but, um, indeed, but as this thing in October took traction, or uh, got traction, clearly they've changed their opinion, therefore they can't trust the populace, which is the whole point in the first place. The other thing that I've noticed, as many of the blogs that I was reading, and I'm not anti many of these politics, I must admit, but there seem to be tacking on to the end of this climate change stuff, which is very serious, and we have to do something very quickly through technology. Um, they're tacking on to the end of it a variety of um, rather predictable leftist uh, politics, which is um, homo, uh, sorry, heteronormativity, uh, anti-trans, um, racism. You should read some of the detail on the forums. Well, I, ha I have to go, I've, I've got some of it in front of me here, not, not the forums, but I've got some of their um, strategy in front of me now. I, I, I have to go to the news headlines, but I'm not sure about what you meant about that in, in that last statement, Paul, but it's clear you're not a fan. Paul calling from Switzerland. I'll just ask you what you think of the demonstrations today. Stupid. What do you reckon? Stupid, proper stupid. I think it's a waste of time. I think I need to go back to work. Right. You're not concerned about climate change? Hotter summers. Colder winters make more money. It's good for me. It don't bother me, if I'm honest. Well, then you can't be celebrating because this is the thing you were adamant wasn't going to happen. Simon is in Rygate. Simon, what do you think? Um, Simon, you know, I'm sort of like, uh, initially I was a remainder. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're Simon. I'm James. I think you might yes, have yes, yes, got yes. the wrong false so name. Initially there. I was a remainder. And I know you're a pretty, pretty sort of like sort of feisty chap. 
I've listened to you a few times and, uh, you know, like, fair enough. But, you know, like, so I was a Rubiner initially, but listening to this stuff, yeah. I have had enough. It, we leave with no deal. And yeah. I'll tell you sort of the thing about your love affair with the European no, Union. No, no, I don't have is, a love affair with the like European Union upon, at all, the person well, claiming to be upon, called Simon. You, you know, you know it, like, it's obvious... There is something about a European Union where you have something, or a currency union, where you have transfer balance of payments. Therefore, in the UK, if London takes all the tax, if London takes all the money, it transfers money to Manchester. That does not happen in Europe, because Germany takes all the money, they have the positive balance. Why did you vote they Remain, then? Transfer. They don't transfer. Why did you vote Remain? Why? why? Initially, because I worked in the banking sector, but now that I look at it, they so you didn't you didn't look at what happened with money they when you worked in the banking sector. They didn't look at the ramifications. The banking sector cannot move. Like you know, the, they're talking so why did you vote Remain then? I, I'm confused. No, I are you didn't saying you only you only looked said, into the financial said, side of things when you were working said, in the banking sector? But James, but this is what you're doing. It's it's it's, it's really annoying people. I didn't say that. I said. <laughs> well, well, I why did you vote voted, Remain, Simon? I didn't vote Remain. I would have had sympathy for it. But you clarify. began the call by saying you did vote but remain. Now, but now, I don't. And you know now what? Sort of, it's three to four years of this stuff. No, no, you definitely Michelle said at the Barclay, beginning that you voted James, to remain. James, James, don't... Simon, get, Simon, no, Simon. I mean, it doesn't matter how many do. times you say my name. I'm going to keep asking you the same question. But you came on the radio, you said, I voted remain. This is what you're doing. You just sound, like, horrible. <laughs> Listen, in, in, in April 2017, Michelle Barnier said... He would have done his job properly if he put in front of the UK a deal that was so bad that we had to turn it down. And there is Simon, who, who both did and didn't vote to remain in the European Union, but um, came to a much better understanding of the financial implications after he'd stopped working in the banking sector. And, and that is what you're reduced to, ph phoning up a national radio station and contradicting yourself in the space of 90 seconds. And then, of course, insulting the person that's asking you the questions, because you can't win an argument, you can only attack the arguer. And, and I mean, I take that, I get paid for it, that's fine. But most people don't get paid for this. You need to explain <laughs> how you've gone from being absolutely adamant that the whole no-deal prospect was never going to happen, the EU were going to fold, the German car industry was going to gallop to our rescue, they were going to blink. It's not happened. It's not happening. The people that told you it was going to happen either made a mistake or told you a lie. And it's reduced people like our last caller, who, who, who said his name was Simon, but I think forgot and then thought he was talking to Simon. It's reduced him to doing what you just heard live on the radio. And, and I, I don't bear him any malice. He can be as rude as he wants about me. But look what they've done to him. And he's still not blaming the people that did it. He's trying to blame the people that feel sorry for him. Um, so it's about turning up the heat on the difficulties. It's about turning up the heat on who uh, Boris Johnson wants to be able to point the finger at in uh, the almost inevitable general election that's coming uh, when he has failed to make real the Brexit that he and Michael Gove and others said would be a walk in the park. Uh, let's hear from Richard in Manchester. Hi, Richard. Hello there. Um, why is it everyone is uh, putting the, uh, the, uh, the guilt at the door, the blame at the door of Boris Johnson? Um, it's not so much Boris Johnson pointing the finger. It's the EU that's been pointing the finger. It's the EU that's been intransigent and failed to move towards uh, a sensible and fair agreement. I think it's really outrageous uh, to hear statements uh, suggesting uh, that Boris Johnson is determined to have a no deal, is determined as a result of it to bring this country down. That's absolute nonsense. I Why think is it outrageous? Can... It's outrageous because it's not the truth. How do you know? Well, what makes you think it is the truth? Do I don't, I don't know. I don't know if down? it's the truth or not. But I, but I do know that he's asking for things that aren't possible to achieve without damaging the Good Friday Agreement, just as Theresa May did. Look, if you have a separation, you have to have a border somewhere. You know, the EU are living in cloud cuckoo land. They somehow think that um, the, the, it is No, they're possible. not. They're living in a land where there is an internationally recognised treaty uh, that requires a soft border, no border, in 
in Ireland, on the island well, of Ireland. Well, it's precisely what uh, uh, Boris Johnson is, is, is suggesting. No, he's some not. Some form of soft, uh, soft gentle uh, um, a border. Customs posts, i.e. a border. Well, you can't, you can't separate from the EU and not have some sort of line, can you? It's impossible. And well, if you can. The you EU can if you're... Will... You can, if we see the difference that, you, that we, we come at it from different positions. Uh, that's why neither of us necessarily needs to be outraged by the other, and you don't need to be outraged by people who disagree with you. But we just come at it from very different positions. The position I come at it from is that the internationally recognised uh, Good Friday Agreement needs to be protected at all costs. Now, that means that some accommodation needs to be arranged uh, between the UK in Northern Ireland and the EU. And I think the obvious sensible way to do that, the one that has the most support in Northern Ireland, and clearly in Ireland as well, but in Northern Ireland, is some kind of backstop arrangement or membership of the Customs Union. It's the DUP stopping that. So, you know, there are, there are different ways to skin this cat, Richard, your way or my way and many other ways as well. So it's not outrageous for people to say that Boris Johnson is choosing a destructive path. It's, it's, it's a perfectly legitimate view to have. Well, I don't think he is following a destructive path at all. I think he's following a very constructive path, and I think he is attempting to come to an agreement. Well, you may say uh, that, and, but uh, Richard, it's, it doesn't change some of the things I just said to you about customs posts on the island of Ireland. Well, look, the reality is that if you ask the people of Northern Ireland whether they want to stay part of Great Britain, I think they will say they would rather stay part of Great Britain and not be separated from Great Britain. Would you not agree with that? Don't know. Let's have a, let's have a border poll and find out. So you, you're actually questioning whether the people who are living and residing in Northern Ireland do not necessarily wish to stay within Great Britain. Well, no, you asked, you asked the question and I well, said I don't the know the answer. That, no, I don't believe that for a second. They want, they want to be, remain part of Great Britain. I don't Therefore, know. Therefore, they don't want to be sucked into a, an eternal uh, situation where they are part of a, a union, this political monolithic union called the European Union. But in, if the it, referendum result is anything to go by, the, you're, you're wrong and I'm right. Well, the 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 uh, situation as we face today now, uh, based on the knowledge that we have several years after the referendum, has changed a lot of thinking. Wouldn't you agree? For both those who were for the Brexit and those who are against Brexit, there's been a lot of additional information. In fact, when the uh, original Good Friday Agreement uh, was uh, uh, constructed and uh, set up, uh, there was no discussion about a, a possible future re referendum. Uh, on the European Union, the implications are so things change, dynamics change, variables change. And, and it's interesting that you say to me, are you really suggesting that the people of Northern Ireland want to border poll and would, and, and would vote to leave Great Britain? It's precisely what members of the Conservative Party would be quite relaxed with. Do you remember that poll well, three or four months ago, maybe six months ago now, in which Conservative Party members said they would happily lose the entire union in order to deliver Brexit? I don't recall that, no, and it well, doesn't it, sort of resonate with what I think the Conservative Party well, is saying. Well, Richard, that. you might not recall it, but it happened, because I talked about it for an hour on the radio, so I do remember it. So you're going to have to so, accept that it happened, I'm afraid. And so don't, you know, there's no point in becoming horrified and shocked at the suggestion that people in Northern Ireland might have changed their minds about being part of the United Kingdom. Turn it the other way around. Uh, Conservative Party members in the United Kingdom are not that fussed about having Northern Ireland as part of said United Kingdom. Uh, so if that's news to you, then go and look it up. Richard in Manchester. Michael has called from Dulwich. Michael, you're quite pleased with how things are proceeding on Brexit. Tell me why. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not quite pleased at all. I'm just saying it's happened. Look, when we, when we signed the, when we had our, our vote, whether it was in or out, it couldn't have been any more clear. It was out or in. In or out. There was no mention of deals, there was no mention of soft borders, there was no mention of anything. It was in or out, and that's it. One vote, make your mind up, and that's it. Well, they've made their mind up. We wanted to be out. It doesn't matter what I, what I voted. The majority of the people wanted to get out. And anything else, all the, uh, all the talk... I mean, you're obviously a Remainer, Sheila, but... And uh, I respect your point. But I'm, but I'm I'm also somebody who is, you know, I'll accept Brexit if somebody can show me that it can be done in as in as undamaging a way as possible that take that takes account of the reality of the Good Friday Agreement. Sheila, Michael, in or out, in or out, we voted out. Forget forget anything else. We voted out. Once we got out, then we can discuss all this rigmarole. But Michael, after. there are some realities that you can't just get around. 
tell me what you can't get around to. The Good Friday Agreement. Look, I was born during the Second World War. There was bombs dropping. Do you think we worried about agreements and what have you? We were oh, having a fight. Michael, and we're, and please don't take it back to the Second World no, War. I might have to go into all, third but, gear. But the tail is wagging the dog. Look at Luxembourg. Belgium. You can drive through these countries and not know you've been there. Yeah. Honestly. It's yeah. great, isn't it? The fifth biggest economy in the world. They're wagging our tails. We're jumping to their... But do you understand crazy. Northern Ireland? Do you understand what it... I'm as, well, I'm, I'm as Irish as you're English. I'm telling you, I understand it more than anybody. I've been there. When the, when the bullets have been thrown, I've been there. Yeah, me tell, tell me you. more. It, it will sort itself out. Oh, will it? it? It's, of course it will. Yeah. Of course it will. Look, the, the, the big the big forces behind And if people it, die while that happens, that's okay, is it? No, it won't. No, it won't. It's business. People, the German, forget Mercedes and everybody. They want to sell their cars in Europe. We will come to an agreement with them. BMW. An agreement, well, after a no-deal Brexit has happened, you mean, will then go yes, and make once, a deal? Yes, it will, it will, it will, it will sort itself out. Mm. And um, these politicians who are, we can't do this, we can't do that. The government, the big companies will say, oh, yes, we can, because we've got the money, you've got the talk. I'll tell you what buys beer. It's not, it's not loud, it's not um, reason and, and hot air buys beer. It's money. And the, and the conglomerates have got the money. Ireland will want, Ireland sells, you, you can't believe how much land they sell to the Arabs every, every, every week. I know the, the fact that the family that do it. There's, there's absolute boatloads of our, uh, land goes to, to do you think that's going to stop because a couple of politicians, Michelle Barney, eh? And well, I don't want to say. Um, Michael, do you, can I can I ask you? Uh, you you've, from, from what I understand, you have said um, before coming on air. You, you think that October the thirty first, we will leave without a deal if there is no deal in the meantime. Yeah. Well, I'm saying, I'm saying whether we, whether it's good or whether it's bad, I don't care one way or the other. But the British people, the English people, the Europe, the UK voted for it. And that was that's what they voted. No ifs, buts, or I think you were right the I mean, first time. It's an English project, isn't it? Really, Brexit. Yeah, it probably it probably is. Yeah, it probably is. But that was plain as a pipe stuff on the on the on the on the voting paper. Uh, yeah, yeah, Michael. In but can, I'm asking you. All right, I'm asking you. And they vote whether you think, it's because I'm, um, uh, you know, the whole question of whether sovereign, whether Parliament is sovereign or not, whether Parliament is, you know, our, our ultimate power, and I believe that it still is. Um, that's why it's annoying Boris Johnson quite as much as it is. But do you you seem to think that on October the 31st, we can just leave, even though the law currently says that we can't, and even though the Prime Minister himself has said that he, he, that he won't allow that to happen because the law stops him from doing so. I'm not a, law, I'm not a lawyer, but that law was passed in England. Does it, does it hold any... And, and, does it hold any walls in, in Europe where they're going to sign a deal? I don't know. I know. I, it, I, yeah, it does. It holds a lot of... of them, it holds... It holds... It, it's... It holds water in England, doesn't it? Well, no, Michael, what it, it, what it, it, is a, it is a British law. So it, it holds water where it needs to hold water in Britain, uh, proving again that we have power o over our own affairs. Well, I don't know, see. I, well, I mean, let's, let's be fair. At the end of the day, it's not what... Uh, I think, or you think, it's what Mercedes Benz thinks, it's what Renault thinks, it's what Peugeot thinks, you it's what ICI, British Petroleum, it's what they think. Yeah. Honestly. So, what's think. been going on in Parliament over the last few months that's caused you know, Boris on, Johnson to them. get so hot they're, under the collar? Well, because he's not, they're not, they're not letting him do his job, are they? Well, Seriously. all those representatives of all of those companies you've just mentioned sitting in Parliament? Well, I think uh, I, I, they. they I don't know. I'm not saying people. What, what are you suggesting that the parliaments are taking back handers of these big companies? Or, or no, you seem you to be suggesting that. I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm, I'm pointing I'm out. I'm pointing out that it isn't uh, Renault and Mercedes and all the other people you mentioned who are having this battle royal over Brexit. It is our sovereign parliament having that battle. Exactly. What's, what's having a battle is a bunch of uh, <laughs> politicians. I don't, they've never had another job in their life, most of them. All right, Michael, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. That was interesting. Acutely aware that this word causes offence, and I wouldn't knowingly cause offence because too much of has happening at the moment, but also where I can't tell you the story, particularly as many of you get up at 8 o'clock in the morning without using the word. I know I've used it a couple of times already, but I'm going to have to use it again. And that I'd ask would respectfully try and moderate our language and if you think as so many people are saying oh now you've become a snowflake why are you not saying the word just 
if you know that something you say, you are aware it causes offence to other people, why would you say it? Why would you say it? In other related conversations, I never... Uh, those golly dolls now, I always refer to as a golly doll because language evolves. And I grew up at a time when this word I'm about to say was used for Germans all the time because it was only it was less than 20 years after the end of the war that I was growing up. So there was obviously people still felt it very keenly. They and others had tried to bomb us out of our homes as we had done to them too. But I don't know that it speaks necessarily for today uh, for my children or indeed for my grandson. I can't imagine that they will view people in that fashion and I don't know that it's exactly healthy. So what is it? It's a poster from the Brexit campaign group, Leave.eu, under fire from politicians over a racist and insulting advert. Well, it's, it's certainly insulting and it's certainly wrong. Is it racist? If you haven't seen it, here we go. There's the poster with the Leave.eu logo at the bottom. Uh, they've managed to catch Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, as if she's giving a Hitler salute. She's, I'm sure she's waving to someone in the crowd, but it could be interpreted thus. It is on the lbc.co.uk website, lbc.co.uk, and the text is, we didn't win two world wars to be pushed around by a kraut. It is demeaning. Is it racist? We'll discuss that with you in a moment. Godfrey Bloom is author, blogger, and former MEP, both as an independent and UKIP, and joins me now. I understand, Mr Bloom, you don't have a problem with this word. Is that correct? Good morning. No, I don't. I don't have a problem with it at all, and neither did Twitter. Twitter's getting stricter and stricter, but they haven't... Uh, they made uh, an, uh, an observation that was no breach of their rules. Look, it, it depends where it starts, doesn't it? I mean, uh, every nation, or most nations, have nicknames that are generally uh, given to them by most of the world. So you have Paddy's Mix, Jock... Oh, this is offence to others, Mr Bloom. Well, first of all, it isn't racist. It can't be, because the British and the Germans have exactly the same gene pool. So you would have to be supremely ignorant to call it racist. We are of the same race. We are different countries, but of the same race. So we can kick that into touch straight away. Is it offensive? Well, I looked at that poster, and I have to tell you, I'm speaking to you from Yorkshire, which is uh, very heavily uh, leave. Right. Uh, and that's how most people in the pub up here in Yorkshire feel. That's how we feel. And that's what the poster says. And if anybody's you... taken offence, uh, well, you know, it... I'm very sorry, but that's how it is. In what way is Germany pushing the United Kingdom around, uh, pushing them around? Uh, well, basically, the European Union is 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 really led by Germany. It's a it's it's a German uh, sponsored and German funded institution, uh, and really the uh, the well, uh, leader of it, of course, is Angela Merkel. But is is and that she, not because Germany is the most senior partner as regards resources and, and finance? Uh, of course it is, yes. and I take no issue with that. That is yeah. absolutely true. Uh, but what she is actually saying is that if you don't break off part of the United Kingdom permanently, there is no deal, which most of us actually find very offensive. So never mind about her being offended or the Germans being offended. We feel offended. I'm offended. So, you know, that's how it is. I'm grateful for your time. Godfrey Bloom, thank you. You serve as MEP for UKIP as an independent and you're an author and blogger too, as I said at the top of the show, and I've said many times. I was a reluctant leave vote. When I hear this sort of thing, it, I just find it intensely embarrassing because it doesn't speak to me. God's sake, let's just get on. I mean, we're British. we stood alone for years. Let's just do it. You know, I mean, I was watching a thing with the Queen. There's, there's billions of people in the Empire. Let's get back to being the British Empire again. That's what it's all about, you know. It's about being the British Empire. OK, thank you. Did anybody here vote to remain? No. <laughs> no, you're not going to get any. No, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. 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 I'm sor
yeah, but why can't they continue doing what they're doing in the building they're in? Why do they have to move everything, all the paperwork, to another building for four days a month? Why is that? Well, I suppose if we were in the European Parliament on a, on a more robust level, we could be agitating to change that from, from inside, couldn't we? That's how but, democracy but works. Why would, but why would we be more robust level? Oh, because we keep electing idiots to go to the European Parliament who've got no interest whatsoever in enacting laws or contributing to the legislative process. I mean, best illustrated probably by Farage's record at the Fishing Committee, which you know, of uh, course. Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. I do know that. How many times but, did he turn uh, up? Uh, once, is it? Out of... I don't know how many times, yeah. 23, Something, 24. So there's your answer. I mean, if there's things about the way things are done that we don't like, we should have spent the last 30 years... Um, behaving like honest brokers and, and wielding our power in that parliament. I, I know less than you do about the, 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 the mobility of paperwork and offices, but it doesn't sound like much of a reason to embrace £15 billion a year of extra costs, according to the government's own papers, simply to come close to trading in the way that we currently do now, does it? You're worried about wasting money. The government's own analysis says £15 billion quid a year just to do the paperwork. Yeah, that's true, but this is an ongoing thing. With well, so would that be? That would be £15 billion pounds a year. How do you mean, £15 billion pounds a year? What, that's what it costs them to move, does it? No, no, that's what the government said yesterday. It will cost British businesses to, to simply fill in the paperwork they need to fill in to trade in a no-deal environment. So they actually said that is what it's going to cost and not what they think it's going to cost? The, the government has done a, 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 an analysis. They wouldn't yeah, claim it was biblical. Seen, yes, but this is the government led by Boris Johnson, Mike. Yeah, but we've all seen these reports of what could happen. And it, yes, and but this is the government is led what? by Boris Johnson, and, and you've forgotten the script, because you're supposed to say that that's a Remainer government. That was Theresa May who didn't really want to leave. These impact assessments now are the ones that people like Michael Gove are trying to keep out of your hands. And the, the £15 billion reported either yesterday or on Monday, that's the government that is planning to do no deal has, has commissioned or, or received that research. So I'm afraid that bit of the script where you pretend not to believe that Theresa May is an honest broker, that doesn't work anymore, my friend. No, well, I don't believe Theresa May was an honest broker. No, that's what um, I just said. I think she's, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but, but Boris Johnson is, you see, if you're a Brexiter, and he's the head of the government that has received the advice that £15 billion a year is what it will cost. So unless it... I mean, I don't know how much it costs to do the thing you said with the, with the paperwork, but if you really voted to leave the European Union because you're worried about money being wasted, um, well, you've done a bit of a boo-boo. Uh, you think? Well, I know. Uh, well, OK. That's your... Uh, well, that's well your, what uh, other reasons yeah. did you have? It can't just have been the fact that they operate in two offices? Um, the continuous movement of people. Ah, where are you calling from? That was another... I'm calling from Portugal. OK, carry on. So, yeah, the con you know, our infrastructure in England at the moment is under great pressure to try and support what oh, is there at the moment. After nine years of and austerity and cuts, yes. Well, you know... Austerity had to happen. Um, you well, can't did it? Did it? Borrowing. Did it? I mean, you know, austerity is the idea. That, uh, what are you going to say about borrowing? Because I have to warn you, I know how much this government has borrowed, and I know what the debt is now compared to when they took over. Exactly, but right. you can't. So it's keep not about that, then, is it? Unless you can't keep borrowing and not have cutbacks. <sighs> right, but they have. Yes, they have. But this is something that has to change. So Mike in Portugal not, voted not... to leave the European Union because there's too much freedom of movement. Is that how is that how we really remember true. this call? Indeed. Okay, mate. Now you know how that looks, right? How does it look? Okay, you don't. My bad. Rupert is in Wokingham. Rupert, what's going on? Uh, well, James, I think I might be able to help you with the scenario uh, about the empty box, um, and that is, I think the reason why uh, Brexit is happy to hold on to the empty box is because when we left the shop with the empty box, we were told that the box was going to collapse, it was going to fall apart. I don't know. This is the sound of my own point. analogy, um, possibly being stretched, stretched to breaking so, point. But I'm not, I'm not interested in what the people you didn't vote for said. I'm interested in what the people you did vote for said. 
what do you mean? So the people that, you know, voted for Brexit. Yes, I'm interested uh, in, in, in the people on that side of the argument. I've heard, for, I mean, more than enough times for one lifetime from, from people claiming that they cast their vote because they knew that the other side were, were telling the truth, even as their own side said they were lying. So in terms of what Brexit has promised, that's, that's the only box we're talking about, Rupert. Sorry to shoot your fox. But you can't just talk about... Oh, I can. You can't just talk about that, can uh, you? Uh, oh, you yes, do. I can. I can you talk about the people who the persuaded side. voters to vote for Brexit because it was going to be a good thing. I'm interested in how you respond to the fact that they were wrong about everything. I'm not interested in what you think about the people you didn't vote for. So if, if you <laughs> take that, saying, OK... <laughs> Uh, oh, so I've, so I've, 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 I've explained it to you now, so if, if, if you want to contribute to the questions that I'm asking, I'm all ears. So, and the question you're asking is? Now that all those promises have been shown to be wrong, all of those claims have been shown to be nonsense, the sunlit uplands have turned into a, into a dark room which we don't know the contents of, and the have your cake and eat it has turned out not even to stretch to powdered eggs, why are people still on the same side as the men that lied to them? Because on the other side... No, 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 but if you feel you were lied to on the other side of the argument, there's no problem. Okay, so what, what, what are the you big lies? Okay, so what, just seeing as it, that's that so that's politeness. why you get this status quo. This is why... But there is no status quo. It's not going to change dramatically. But there is no status quo. £15 billion a year it's going to cost in, in, in red tape alone for British businesses. That's not Project Fear, that's government analysis. Operation Yellowhammer is not Remaniac's propaganda, it's government analysis. You've seen what happened to the pound yesterday, you saw what happened to it the morning after the result. That's not Project Fear or lies or balancing out fibs about sunlit uplands and 350 million quid a week. That's fact, that's recorded, measurable, countable fact. So I, I, I understand you have to cling to the notion that there's some sort of equivalence here, but all you're doing is demonstrating the desperation that, that has been thrust upon you. Well, you're taking the pound, you're right, the pound did devalue after the Brexit vote. But, and, uh, and yesterday as well. But, but a week later, it actually closed up higher. So. Which is why I just added, but, and yesterday but, as well, but, when no deal looked more likely. Well, well, you know, if a pound devalues, is it a horrendous thing? It actually helps a lot of manufacturing businesses. Cause like sports well, which better. would have been great if that's what they'd said before the referendum, that the pound will go down, and then you can explain to people who aren't in manufacturing businesses or shareholders in manufacturing businesses, you could explain to them why that was a price they should pay in order to... Um, improve the trading conditions of the companies you refer to. But they didn't say that before the referendum, did they, Rupert? I, I, I think my point is that unless you <laughs> Just see... At least, answer, answer, at least answer the question, Rupert. Well, no, unless you see... They didn't say answer, any of that before the referendum, did they? No, they didn't. Right, carry on. But people are not going to change their opinion if there's no economic downturn. Because, right. you know, people are not well, going to change their opinion that's, that's, on hearsay. Hear, hearsay? Moment, Hearsay. Exactly. Okay. Exactly, because at the moment there's no definitive uh, result that is, you know, gone into economic catastrophe. But we're not uh, talking about happens, economic catastrophe. We're talking about sunlit uplands. We're talking about having your cake and eating it. We're talking about the easiest deal in human history. We're talking about the German car industry refusing to countenance any possibility of us crashing out without a trading agreement. We're talking about Digby Jones knowing that was true. We're talking about Liam Fox knowing it would be, or believing it would be the easiest deal in human history. We're not talking about anything else. We're talking about all of the people who lined up to tell you things that have turned out not to be true. We're talking about Michael Gove insisting that no deal was not even a vague possibility. Daniel Hannan insisting that the status of European Union citizens living here would in no way be affected. We're talking about all the things that were stated and that have already been shown to be untrue. You can't counter that by saying, well, some of the stuff may still turn out to be true. Uh, I think, you know, those things you list out, I, you know, people voted generally with no information. They voted with their heart, not with their head. Yes, that's my so point. It, and that's why, they can't, of, that's why they can't admit that they're wrong. Because it's an emotional vote, not an intellectual one. And here you are proving it. But, but likewise, how do you turn that around? 
Well, you encourage people to stop voting with their heart and to start using their head. But with that, people I, need stuff which is tangible. And at the moment, no, you know, it's all it's like there, no, it's, it's, no, not, it's, it's no, not tangible, you're, James. You're, you're back again to, to, to claiming that because things aren't even worse than they than they are already, that's that, that somehow your vote isn't yet rendered ridiculous. I've just listed all the things you were told, all the things that influenced many, many, many voters. None of them were true. So I, why do those I voters... I was told. I was told to be mass unemployment. I was well, told... That, not know, not by the people you answer. voted for. And, Rupert, not by the people you voted for. I, th again, this is this is but heartbreaking. James, surely you listen to two sides of the argument. Yes, yes, yes. yes of course you do. Of course you do. And so then, and then it turns side, out that I the, feel like I've been lied to. No. So the what were the big? What were the big? Happened. What were the big lies? Then you feel on the Remain side. So George Osborne quoted that there would be on a Brexit vote a significant impact on unemployment, and unemployment would go up. David Cameron said that there would be um, a uh, economic downturn uh, and we would go into recession. And if, uh, if right. those were my and exactly, and if those were my reasons for voting to remain, I would now have to account to you as to why I'm still there. But what I couldn't say is, oh, well, some of the stuff the people on the other side wasn't said wasn't true either. I'm examining the reasons for the casting of a vote, a positive casting of a vote, not the reasons for why you didn't vote for the other side. And all you're left with now is the thing you... I mean, forgive me for being glib, but the thing you're most looking forward to, what, what, what constitutes the prize or the jackpot that you voted for three and a half years ago? The improvement in your life or the improvement in my life? I'll take either. The prize is that basically democracy is on it. Right. Until you have another referendum or you but, have... But you know, that, you know election, I want more than have, that. I want a, that, a tangible yeah. benefit. Because you were promised yeah. millions. A, a tangible benefit yeah. to me... What's going to get better? That we operate in a democracy <laughs> and a democratic <laughs> oh. vote is on it, James. Yeah. Final, is, final is chance. Final chance. What is going to be better? What is going to be worse? Well, I've already told you. I mean, several times, 15 billion quid a year, according to the government's own analysis. Oh, OK, abolition of freedom of movement, Rupert. That's, that's, it, it's clearly worse not to have freedom of movement than it is to have freedom of movement. I'll just leave you to ponder that. And hopefully, and I say this with love, to, to, to wonder how they've done this to you. Just before we go to the news break, let's hear from uh, Greville, uh, who's calling from Camelworth. Hi, Greville. Yeah, good afternoon. I was listening to you earlier on, and I will certainly take some issues with you about, uh, you know, impugning Boris Johnson's uh, sincerity in attempting to seek a deal. I mean, the deal, as I saw it, that was sent fairly recently, seemed a very well-argued and set-out document uh, for reasonable consideration by the EU. And I can't see how he has not attempted to uh, reach a deal. Uh, well, th the reason I've come to this conclusion is that... He knows that the Good Friday Agreement and, and, and the depth of history and emotion and hurt and violence and politics that, that bleeds off every page of it um, means that uh, customs posts, customs arrangements, customs depots, customs stopping points, whatever you want to call them, inside the Republic of Ireland uh, for British purposes is absolutely not going to fly. He knows that. Of course he knows that. Well, I... I I can't agree with that because there are lots of borders all over the EU, some of them thousands of miles long, and the great border around Kaliningrad, which is a Russian enclave in Poland, there are no problems like that at all. And you know, uh, the EU itself was not party to the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, I wonder what is their interference in it now in the way that they are because you know i was in ireland yesterday on business i was in uh, london Derry, which as you possibly know is right on the border and indeed we do business with companies on both sides of that border i don't envisage any problems at all and i've spoken to irish people about this and i don't get the impression that they're over alarmed but by what he has uh, come up with um, why do you say that there are no problems at all and compare it to a border that has an entirely different history? Because everybody, well, on, the, the everybody on the island of Ireland and Boris Johnson and Theresa May and Leo Varadkar and members of the EU and American presidents and Nancy Pelosi in, in the States, even Donald Trump, they know that it is a particular border with a particular history with particular thorny issues around identity. 
Well, all borders will have some issues. So the Kaliningrad border was only established in 1945 when Stalin annexed that to Russia. Uh, the Irish border, I think, has settled down and people know how to cope with it and live either side of it and in both parts of it. And, and I think that the issues we now see have been manufactured. They've been manufactured by the EU and people who have advised the EU. It, there could be an amicable arrangement, and yet they're trying to frustrate the possibility of, a, of an amicable, amicable arrangement. Well, we don't that know. Is as I see it. We don't know that they're trying to frustrate it. I mean, even even now they're in talks uh, about it, so that maybe there is a solution that between them they can come to. And this notion that was put forward on October the second by Britain, which I think screamed non-starter uh will will lead to something else but but in and of itself it, it won't do well I, I see it as capable of solution and a very simple solution we know the swiss border operates across five separate borders with, with no problems i've mentioned kaliningrad and there are other great borders uh, in the eu and i don't see why the tiny irish border because the people on both sides of that border they're related uh, they have common interests. They're used yeah, but they're to not afraid of each. each no, they're not afraid of each other, Greville. They're afraid of terrorists. They're afraid of a breakdown in an agreement oh, that's no, no, brought no. We, decades we, we of peace. Can't. We can't give way to threats, would-be threats, potential threats by terrorists. That is not a valid reason. And like I said, the EU is not party to the Good Friday Agreement, and its interference may be uh, detrimental. It would be best left to the British they're not interfering the to come up with a solution. They're not interfering. Ireland, the, well, Republic, the, Rep the Republic of Ireland is a member, a continuing member, uh, and, and, and a, a member that plans to remain a member of the European Union. And we are negotiating with the European Union, so they have to take into account the particular sensitivities of Ireland. Well, the Taoiseach uh, seems to have uh, been working with the EU. Maybe he would have been better working within the Good Friday Agreement, to which the EU is not a party. All right, Greville, I think we're now going round in circles, but thank you very much indeed for your call, Greville, in Kenilworth. Chris has called from Stockport, and you've got a bit of a bone to pick with Remain supporters, Chris. Fire away. Well, you, well hi, Sheila. Good hi afternoon. It's, it's, it's not that, Sheila. I think, I think with, with the greatest respect, I think we're getting into very, very dangerous territory here. Um, basically, we're, we're talking about a government of national unity. Um, we know how many people vote for the referendum. It's quite a few, 70.4 million. If this, and I do believe that if there's a second referendum, Remain will win. Now, the problem becomes then is this government of national unity, unity of what? I, I, I genuinely believe, and I don't like to say this, but I, I, I think there will be consequences. I really, really do. What do you if mean? the referendum, well, if the referendum result is overturned, I really, I genuinely believe that. Does that not depend? Because, does it not depend on how it's overturned? If it is, well, if if it's overturned, it's overturned. Surely, what's what's? I I, I get a daily newspaper, and, he, and 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 you can comment on various articles. I'm sure you know which paper I'm talking about. And, and no, basically, actually, what, I don't. Oh, well, well, if you want to, it's the Times. Okay. And basically, what's what's happening in the Times now, uh, on a daily basis, you're getting people coming on on the Remain side, and basically what they're saying is, we've got far more intellect than anybody that voted Leave. And I'm, I'm getting a bit peeved with that. Uh, and, 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 and also, you, you know, I think if it is overturned, what's the government of national unity going to do? I just can't see how that's going to solve anything because people, Sheila, and, and, and I'd be one of them, I would do anything, but I, I'd be very, very annoyed if it got overturned. The way, the way I would, I would be coming to see this, I would, I would basically try and back Ken Clark's plan where, you, where you'd come out of the EU politically but stay within, try and have a customs arrangement with the EU, that, and, and, but making sure that you've withdrawn politically. And I, I think, basically, that's, that's, that's the only way you can go. Well, you're trying to try to answer your question about the government of national unity, um, it, it wouldn't last long if it, if it happens at all. Um, 
Uh, uh, well, where, would, where would the unity be? Uh, my understanding of that title for said government, if it happens, is that it, it is about Parliament saying to the sitting Prime Minister and the sitting government, no, you've lost our confidence. And when a Prime Minister formally loses the confidence of Parliament, he or she falls and the Queen is allowed to say, see ya, um, as long as she is confident that someone else has... The, uh, has Parliament behind him or her, so it would be the unity of Parliament as much as anything else, and as as much as an it wouldn't be some kind of ongoing national unity government for the next two but, years. But, 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 but they can't agree on that, Sheila, can they? Because no, nobody, they nobody, nobody with a right mind. I'm a Labour voter, right, and I resigned from the Labour Party the day Jeremy Corbyn got elected because I know his past. Now, the kids don't, unfortunately, but people of my age, unfortunately, do. And I resigned from the Labour Party the day Jeremy Corbyn got elected. Mm. I would never... I, I, that guy couldn't run a sweet shop, never mind the country. Uh, so, the, 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 and, and Joe Swinson quite rightly says it, she won't work with him. But then you move on to the Liberal Democrat. How can they call themselves Democrats? Democrats, if they're saying, oh, we'll, we'll revoke Article 50. Well, what does that say? What does well, that say? All right. Well, you've asked me a question. You've, you've asked me a question. Let me try and answer it. I, okay. oh, I, I, because I've asked them that question. Uh, their answer, both Joe Swinson's and Vince Cable's, their answer to those questions, uh, to that question, it is if we overturned a Conservative government and a Labour Party opposition and became the majority government having stood on a manifesto in, in a general election of absolutely clear as day, no Brexit, if we win a majority, we revoke it, and they get that majority, then that is a democratic mandate to revoke Article 50. That is do what they would say to you. Of, of course, of course they would. But do, do, do you seriously think that the Liberal Democrats no, would I win don't. an overall majority? No, I don't. Neither do I. No, no, I don't. Do I. No, I don't. But they are, but hey, if they do, that's, that's the answer to your question. Yeah, yeah. And in my view, I don't know about yours, but in my view, that would be a seismic political event in this country, and it would without doubt be a mandate that completely trumps the referendum. Yeah, well, and, uh, I see, yeah, I see, but, but with respect, people, are, and, and with respect, Sheila, I've heard you say it before mm -hmm. about, oh, you've got to explain this. Yeah, and, 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 and it does annoy people like me. But, but the, the, the North has been politically hit for years and years and years. And that's why a lot of people voted to leave. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got the Labour Party, Tom Watson, saying, we will, we will become a Remain party. What does that say? To people like Caroline Flynn, uh, Melly Leon, and, and others, Lisa Nandy, in the north and the northwest of Yorkshire, who said, "No, you must honour the result." Stephen Kinnock, you mm. must honour the result. Mm. I, I, I really don't know where we're going with it, um, but unfortunately, nobody does. My, my, my point is that if this is overturned and we turn round and say, "I'm sorry." Forget what happened three years ago. We're going to bin it. What will be the consequence? And I don't know, Sheila. I'm, I'm, See, I, I strongly I believe. Know. I strongly believe that if that happens, the manner of it happening is absolutely vital for it to be accepted. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it, I don't, I don't it, think you will accept it if it happens at all, will you? Well, 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 well no, I'd be very annoyed. And, and a, lot, a lot of my friends and colleagues will be. Because we, we were yeah, told... But yeah, but you can be annoyed and, yeah, but you can, you can be annoyed and still accept something, can't you? I will, if, if we get a decent Brexit deal and we leave, um, and then we move on to the trade talks, well, I will accept that, but I will be annoyed by it and sad about it and a bit miffed that it's happened. That's, that, that's, that's, why, why, that's why, well, why can't we compromise then? Go down the Ken Clark Road. <laughs> Come out of it politically. Have you met Boris Johnson? Have you seen him on the telly and heard him on the radio? Yeah, well, he, he's got an agenda, hasn't he? Oh, he's got an he agenda. His, his agenda he's is to be prime it, minister and to kill yeah, off Nigel yeah, Farage's party. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because the Tories know they will get annihilated at a general election if they're not withdrawn from the, the, the EU by the 31st of October. They know that. Dominic Rabb said it.
that we will be toast. But uh, at the end of the day, you you can't have a system whereby you say this is a a once-in-a-lifetime thing, we guarantee that this, whatever the result, this will be carried out, and then... Three, I oh know no, it's dragged on, and God knows, everybody knows it's dragged on and on and on, and turn around and say, oh, I'm sorry, that's not what we're doing now. Um, we're going to do something, people are going to revoke and we're going to remain. Because pe- pe- people genuinely and quite will be very, very disappointed and, and annoyed about it. All right, thank you, Chris. Now we've seen Mr. Sassini, or whatever his name is, actively negotiating with the Speaker of the House of Commons behind the back of the government. I mean, that is just breaking all normal diplomatic protocols. They will use whatever lever, whatever black arts at at their disposal to prevent the United Kingdom from leaving the European Union, and that is simply not acceptable. Well, you raise a lot of interesting points. Uh, I want to ask, uh, are you more annoyed at Mr. Cecily or John Berko? Well, I, I, I think uh, I think we all know uh, we, 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 we we've all got uh, we know what Mr. Burko's form is, and we've got a lot of experience of him. What we're not used to uh, is foreign officials and representatives actively um, negotiating and conspiring behind the bags. Conspiring. Of our well, consp- well, what were they talking about? I don't know what they. Well, were you don't know what they were about. talking about. And you're sure it's a conspiracy. Well, I mean, why why would they want to talk to the Speaker of the House of Commons? Well, why wouldn't they? Well, he, he doesn't represent the British people. He represents the House of Parliament, the House of he Commons. Doesn't re- he doesn't represent the pe- British people. He hasn't been elected. Neither is Boris Johnson. Bri- well, Bro- Bro- Boris Johnson is the democratically elected Conservative leader and therefore Prime Minister because the Conservative Party won the most uh, seats at the last general election. And John Berko is the Speaker of the House of Commons. If he wants to have discussions, not least after your Prime Minister try to shut Parliament down, what's wrong with that? John Burke, I, I, well, you may disagree with me, but fair enough, but I don't think it's a right or appropriate for the European Union to be negotiating with anybody apart from the official British representatives representing the British government and the British And people. how do you know we'll they were negotiating? To, well, we'll, have to neg- we'll have to agree to, to, to disagree. Well, but I'm, I'm not stating a you? point of view. I'm asking you to explain yours. You've told me there's a conspiracy and you've told me they're negotiating. Where's your evidence? I, I may have, uh, I, to have used the word conspiracy, I may have over pudding. I don't know what they were discussing. It is, however, disconcerting and rather, uh, it is rather disconcerting to think that European Union officials are negotiating with the Speaker and many of us do believe that he has not been a fair referee in this. And where's and your evidence for negotiation? back the Remain side. Well, they, they've clearly had discussions. I've been discussions, yes. To... That's different from negotiations. We're having a discussion, well, but we're not negotiating I, anything. I've just, I've just been listening to Mr. Mr. Sassini in the European Parliament on Twitter, where he has... Have you watched um, his speech in the European Parliament yes. this afternoon? Uh, and did he not say in that speech that he had been meeting with the Speaker in order to ensure that before we leave the European Union there is some general election or referendum? Is that not, is that not a prelude to some sort of discussions? Well, well, you're talking now about a prelude to discussions where you were telling me a few moments ago several times it was a negotiation. I'm Jim's at Heathrow. Jim, um, what would you like to say? Well, good morning, James. Hello, um, well, I'm a Leaver. Uh, I'm an ardent Leaver. And I've got no qualms about having a second referendum. Well, would, would you rather have that than an election? Well, let me explain why. If we have well, a no, general on, just, election... Just, just, just yes or no. You'd rather have yes. a referendum than an election? Well, yes, I could okay, explain cool. why, if you yeah, like. Good. No, I just wanted to be clear that's the position you were explaining. Right. If there's, a, if there's a general election, we all know Boris will smash it and there'd be Brexit. Probably no deal. But if there's a second referendum... You, came, and, oh, you, you, sorry, you know he had, a meeting, he had a meeting yesterday after which about 60-odd Conservatives were temporarily persuaded that he wouldn't campaign on a no-deal Brexit. Yes, but like I say, in the general election you get Farage's Brexit party and the Conservatives fighting against each other. Yeah, then Boris will probably still win... But if there's a second referendum, you've got the two most current formidable politicians this country has in Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage fighting on the same side. Which, which Nigel well, Farage? Not, not the one who failed to win a seat eight times. 
Yes, but who, who orchestrated the boat, boat leave in 2016? No, now, he, he wasn't Boris, in boat leave. He was in leave EU. Leave EU are the organisation that just apologised for those racist anti-German posters, right? OK, if we've got... No, is that, is that the organisation you're talking about? Are you going to let me finish? Yes, of course. Just say yes or no. Is that the organisation you're talking about? The one that just yes. apologised for the racist yes. anti-German posters? And what nationality are Farage's children? Uh, I've got no idea what your nationality is. Half German, mate, are. but you crack on with the most formidable right, politician right, in the right, country. Right, you've got the most formidable, two most formidable politicians in the country. <laughs> Lost to a dolphin on the, one time, didn't he? On the leaves, didn't right? he lose to a man dressed as a dolphin once? Uh, let me ask you a question. Who's going to be fronting the side for the main in the second referendum? Well, I, I kind of think, off the top of my head, I might fancy it. Well, let's say it'd be you versus Nigel Farage and Boris it's Johnson. Happened, it's happened before, Jim. Look it up. Good, good luck with that. Yeah, you should look it up. So anyway, you know what I do now. What, what are you most looking forward to about leaving? What am I most looking forward to about leaving? An echo. Not signing up to the European Army, not having my kids conscripted you, when is, they're 16. Right, just go away and Google that, will you? Uh, better than some Britain, look what they're saying, look no, what Steve no, no, Baker's no, saying. No, I don't, Brexit hard brand Steve Baker, Jim, you're, you're better than that. I Just go away. I don't need to Google do, stuff, do, I don't need no, to Google stuff, information that I already have. No, but you haven't got information, you've got falsehoods. Uh, do you know what Petso is? <laughs> Just go away and Google, will British people ever be conscripted into a European army, whether we leave or remain? Go away and Google, the, do you know what the word veto means? Yeah, we lose our veto once the Lisbon Treaty kicks in in 2022. Oh, oh, Jim, mate, that has been rubbish. That stuff you read on Facebook has been pulled apart by everybody and you haven't noticed because you think it's information rather than lies. Lisbon Treaty's well, like, done like, and dusted, like, like, Jim. Like the lies in, like the lies in Project Fear? No, Project Jim. Fear no, nothing like that, Jim, because what you've just described is written down on your Facebook page, describing... I'm not, I'm not on Facebook. Well, OK, then, on, it's come through your letterbox. The Lisbon Treaty is finished. It's done and dusted. There is nothing that happens in 2022 as the result of the Lisbon Treaty. This isn't an argument. This is me saying 2 plus 2 is 4, and you saying, hang on a minute, I think you'll find it 6. Well, that's two different opinions. No, then. no, 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 no. No, two plus two equals six is not an opinion, Jim. Two plus two doesn't equal six. Two plus two equals four. Right, and the Lisbon Treaty is done and dusted, mate, and nothing kicks in in 2022. Nothing at all. And we will have the power of veto over any future European Defence Force or, or European cooperation. But when you look... I, 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 would, not, I would not trust John Barnier to us. No, well, no, of course you won't, because you trust the man who can't win a by-election against a fellow dressed as a dolphin. You just don't like Farage, do you? <laughs> oh, there's a plane going overhead. Yeah. Well, anyway, got to go. Work to do. Yeah, of course you have. Oh, every single day. We do get along great with the Kurds. We're trying to help them a lot. Don't forget, that's their territory. That's we have to help them. I want to help them. Go ahead. What's next? They fought with us. They fought with us. They died with us. They died. We lost tens of thousands of Kurds died fighting ISIS. They died for us and with us and for themselves. They died for themselves. But they're great people. And we have not forget. We, we don't forget. I don't forget what happens someday later. But I can tell you that I don't forget. These are great people. And when it comes to expressing any allegiance with the Kurdish forces, the U.S. partners, here's what the president had to say. Now, the Kurds are fighting for their land, just so you understand. They're fighting for their land. And as somebody wrote in a very, very powerful article today, they didn't help us in the Second World War. They didn't help us with Nor Normandy, as an example. They mentioned names of different battles. Well, whether or not they did, most people are left scratching their heads at that comment, I have to say. And an increasing number of Republicans make the point that it's about us now abandoning our partners, the Kurdish forces that we have fought with to, uh, to put down ISIS. It's about leaving them now to face the onslaught of the Turkish troops on their own. I just want to say one thing about what President Trump said. He said that the Kurds did nothing on the Normandy landing and so on. I'm sorry, the Kurds fought with the British in Iraq against a pro-Nazi coup during World War II. The Kurds fought on the side of the West. And as one man, just Kurdish man, just said to me now, once again, he said, we the Kurds have been thrown to the wolves. Yeah, I'm going to squeeze Richard in, in Winslow. Wim, is it Wimslow? Winslow. 
Yeah, Buckinghamshire. Um, my oh, name is John Burko. Um, I was listening with great interest to the uh, the guy about the um, figures if 10% switch from Brexit to Conservative, then they'd have a majority. Mm-hmm. Now, in Buck- I've voted 50 years for the Conservative Party. Recent years, I've gone for um, UKIP, and I would vote Brexit because I'm sick to death of being strangled by the EU and dishonoured by MPs. Um, in what way are you strangled making, by the EU? Hang on, hang on. The point I'm oh, okay. making is Must that if speak. I and 5,000 others where I live change from Brexit to um, back to Conservative, it wouldn't make the slightest bit of difference in my constituency because it is such a strongly Conservative constituency. So the only difference were a change of uh, Brexiteers to another party, Conservative or whatever, would make a difference. Is in marginals. And my question is, did that um, chap factor that in to his calculations? Because it's all very well saying if 10% of Brexit came across, you'd get 44%. But you wouldn't necessarily, because in hard Conservative strongholds, um, as I say, another 5,000 Brexiteers in my area who voted Conservative wouldn't make much difference. We'd still get a Conservative not John Burke this time back. Okay, well, no, it won't be him, will it? He's not standing. In, but uh, but I, I, need, yeah. I need to get a sense from you of in what way you believe the EU was strangling you in, in your life. Well, essentially, in a nutshell, they take money from us and um, give us a bit back and tell us how to spend it. Um, I, I really... The EU morphed. I voted to join the EEC way back... In 75, we weren't given a choice, as you know, we were taken in. That was a trading organisation of half a dozen consanguineous na- uh, nations. We've now moved, morphed into um, this federal system that want their own army. They want to force um, uh, the euro on people. They should never have let Greece in and wreck their poor economy. Uh, and there's so many other things I could go into. They say we, as Brexiteers, didn't know what we voted for. But I didn't know when I voted uh, to leave that once a month they moved lock, stock and barrel from from Brussels to Strasbourg just to appease the French. And that cost about £1.3 million. Okay, uh, you clearly could go on forever, Richard, but I'm afraid I can't. It's the end of my programme. And it's tense here too in D.C. for President Trump with the impeachment inquiry continuing. His attempts to stonewall it have not been successful. Every day there are uh, depositions and every day there is new evidence. And this uh, sets the scene for his first rally since the impeachment inquiry began. Last night he was in Minneapolis. He was angry, he was aggressive, he was fighting himself out of a corner he says he's been backed into. He says Democrats are sick and deranged and he told the crowd that they just want to erase their vote. And in her home state, he singled out Congresswoman Ilhan Omar and said that she is an American-hating socialist. Everything about Omar is a fraud, including her name. Scott reports his sources told him that, quote, Omar's legal husband was Omar's brother and that she had married him for fraudulent purposes. You mean like coming into the United States, maybe? Like so many of his insults, there is absolutely no proof that she married her brother. In her words, she says it is absolutely false and ridiculous. He is well known for his very personal attacks, but this tirade last night was stark in its offensiveness. But first, let's nip across to our friend Mark in Lewisham and get his view. Mark, good morning to you, sir. Yeah, good morning. How are you? You all right? Not at all bad, my friend. Yes, not at all bad. Are you enjoying the weekend so far? So far, but the last guy that was on was a Remainer, wasn't he? Well, he certainly voted Remain, and he would like yeah, us to remain. So, if that, that makes him a Remainer, a Remainer he was, Mark. Yes. Yeah, but he couldn't. He, yeah, the typical Remainer couldn't be tw- couldn't pick between lamb and beef, could he? <laughs> you know, it, well, that's the truth of it, isn't it? It's like we voted. The majority of the country voted to come out of Europe. Let's come out. Yeah. Deal or no deal, let's just come out. Remind why me why you doing, voted why, to... Why have we put yeah. up with this for all these... When did we vote for it? 2016. Remind me, Mark, why you voted to come out. I can't remember. Why, why, I, I voted to come out of Europe mm. because this country is not in charge of its own destiny. Mm. When Everything we do is goes back to 
Brussels, and Brussels tells us what to do. So when we do a free trade deal with the EU, Mark, after we've left, so that we can continue trading relatively easily with them, you accept that we, our companies that want to send goods to the EU will have to abide by EU rules? No. Oh. We should make up our own rules. But then they won't take our... We're in charge of our own Then they won't take our goods, Mark. Well, trade with other countries, then. Oh, trade with other countries. We, even though, to, e even though the be, EU is this massive trading block, a massive Europe, market on our doorstep. That's just a little bit silly, isn't it? Oh, because it's on our doorstep. We have to depend on it. Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? Well, why does it? Because it's just a massive just, just, market just, in our no, backyard. Because they're 11 miles away across the channel, mm. we have to depend on them. No. So in the meantime, we're, we're, we're trying to strike some free trade deals with the rest of the world, will we? How quickly do you think we can do that? Or do you, well, think, do you think it'll all be fine on WTO rules? It will take time. Everything mm. takes time. It's Are you an exporter, well, Mark? Hold on, hold on. You're saying to me mm. about it takes time. Yeah, it's taken us time to come out of it Europe. It has, indeed. Are you an exporter? You know, three years. So, so why don't we just wait three years to make up free trade with other countries? Do you export goods yourself? Yeah. Do I export? No, yeah. Do I export goods? Yeah. No, but I've, I've worked in this country all my life. What do you do? What do I do? I'm a heating and ventilation engineer. Do you think that whether we leave or not, other than whether or not the economy sinks and it will, if we have a no deal Brexit, likely suffer and possibly or probably go into recession? But beyond that, how do you think Brexit would affect you? Affect you negatively? Affect me negatively? Yes. Well. It's hard to say because it hasn't happened, is it? But what we do know is that it could make life very something? difficult for how exporters. Do you care about your fe Do you care about your fellow men and women who export for a living? Um, <clears throat> yes, hmm. but it's, it's all it's all a lot of this. A lot of what's going on now hmm. is scaremongering. Oh, don't do this, don't do that. By I whom? Mean, how do we know? Do you think we I'm scaremongering? We haven't done that. No, we nothing. don't know, but there are all how sorts we, of things. How we, can we yeah. say this is going to happen, that's going to happen? Well, we don't know we anything's going to happen, Mark, because we can't any of us be certain of what's going to happen in the future, so it relies on our best estimate. Now, I'm not scaremongering because I've told you quite explicitly, and I'm not playing games with you, I've held this line for years now, that I think we do need to come out of the EU because people like you, Mark, in your great wisdom, decided that we should in a narrow majority on the 23rd of June 2016. So I'm saying let's get out. We've got to get out. I would not like us to go with a no deal because I think that could be really, really destructive. But let's get out with a deal. Let's persuade our politicians to back some sort of deal. So I'm not, I'm not playing silly buggers. But I'm still saying to you, Mark, that it is going to be very difficult and, and may well be extremely difficult once we leave. And all I would at least like you to have the good grace and courtesy to accept is that that is a possibility and it could be very painful for some of your fellow citizens. But you can't really accept that, can you? Well, of course it's going to be unacceptable to some people. Dude. The rich people aren't going to like it because they're not lining their pockets, are they? What about the exporters? They're not all rich. The exporters, of course they are. Are they all of them, are they? What about the people who work for the exporters that might go out of business? Well, it's, 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 that's the way it goes. Find business elsewhere. That's oh. what everyone has to do. You can't just... You just can't... <laughs> we vote for democracy... We voted to come out. Mm. Come out. Some people are going to get injured. Right. It's not having a war. How, how bad do it's like having a war? with another country, uh, you've got to expect casualties. Why did you vote for a war, though, Mark? I didn't vote for a war. You just I said it was like voting for... It's like a, a war. I voted to come out because mm. this country is not in charge of itself. That's but why did, you just said out. it's like a war. Why did you vote for a war? I didn't vote for a war. I just used that as a phrase. But you said it's we, like a war, so you effectively voted for a war. No, I didn't vote for a war, did I? Now, when we when we vote, when we had the Brexit, when we was asked if we wanted to vote to cut, stay in or come out, I voted to come out. Uh -huh. I didn't vote for a war, did I? You're, which you're bits? Just, which bits? Given that you're not an exporter, now, Mark. You? Hang on. Which you're bit? You're just turning my words around now against me. I'm just That's using the words doing, that you used, Mark. Listen, I ask you a question. Said it's like a war. Yeah, well, that's I exactly. So I said, why I did you vote for a war? I didn't mean war. you literally voted I didn't for a war. I voted for a war. I said it's like a war. Why did you vote for Obviously something like you a don't war? Listen to what people say. I'm listening to you, very carefully, Mark. You think you're right all the time. Mark, are you listening to what? me now? I'm I don't saying. Know. Am I listening to you? I, you I don't know. I can't tell. 
I'm asking you a question. If you want to answer it, you can. If you don't, I'll speak to Matthew Ask in Islington. the question is, but make sure it's not a silly one. The question is, Mark, why did you vote for something that has the effects of being like a wall? It's not like a... It's, it's, oh, Mark, God, you've just, just said that. A coin of phrase. I use the coin of well, phrase... Well, don't use phrases you don't mean, then, literal. Mark. Don't use you're phrases you don't mate, mean. You're unreal, aren't you? You, t you turn everyone's words around on them. No, this is what just you yours, do. Mark. This is what you're paid to do. You're a robot. <laughs> you might as well go and hold Jeremy Corbyn's hand. I can't stand don't Jeremy Corbyn, Mark. You obviously don't you spend want... much time listening to me, do you, my friend? Why should I listen to you? You're talking rubbish. OK, well, now you're just being country, rude. we vote hmm. to come out of Europe. Yeah, why did you vote to come out of Europe? Because we didn't have enough control. We didn't have enough control of what, Mark, in your day-to-day -day you life? I vote to come out of Europe because we're not in charge of our own destiny. You vote for a government... Which bit of our destiny are you concerned about? The Brussels tells this government hmm. what to do. In what areas? In all areas. Really? In well, all like areas. income I'm tax? Here. Foreign I'm policy? On building site. Hmm? I'm working there. Let's see how much you actually know. You need to well, give me I'm some examples. That's what I'm, that, when, I'm here to learn, when, Mark. I want now, you to I'll teach me. Question, when are you supposed to wear a hard hat? You tell me you work on the building site, presumably all the time you're on the site. Well, I just answered your question yeah. about I just answered now yours. Am I right or am I wrong, Mark? You, ask, you wear a hard hat yes. when there's machinery overhead. That sounds sensible to me. Does it sound sensible right. to you? So when I'm working inside, mm. under EU regulations mm. now in this country, when I'm working inside mm -hmm. with a ceiling above my head, I have to wear a hard hat. Mm. Is that a disaster? Is a disaster? You try wearing a plastic hat all day long mm. in the summer. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> Why do you have to wear a, a plastic? Why do you have to wear country. a plastic? Why? See what I mean? No. You see, this is why people don't like you. Won't let me, you won't let me get a word in edgeways, Mark. Government. All you want to do is rant really, at me. Why don't you, you listen? Don't Could you wear a nylon vest all day? So you've got to wear a T-shirt at work. Mm. You have to wear a nylon vest and a hard hat <laughs> and a pair of boots. <laughs> Who's that in the background, Mark? So when you go abroad... Everyone's working under the same EU regulations, yeah? Mm. So when you go abroad, when you go to these nice, sunny, hot countries, you don't see anyone wearing hard hats, high visions. There's a conspiracy, is it? They've got it, in for, they've got it in so for you in Lewisham, Mark. <laughs> they, I voted out <laughs> to come out of Europe. <laughs> so I'm you don't have to wear a hard hat to this. keep you safe. I've got it. Could you just so explain to me... So when you go to other countries... Mark, you you're not letting me speak, my friend. Why are they applying the same rules? So I'm, I'm asking there's you, do you... There's one rule for England, <laughs> there's one rule for England, so it's a, and there's one it's a conspiracy for theory, is it, that you're, that you're pushing here, Mark? It's, that you've, they've, they've got it in for you, just you, in Lewisham, no, or, or no, all the Brits? No, they've got it in for me. They've no. got it in for the whole, the whole of England. Why don't it's they have to wear to hard hats in other countries, do you think? narrow strip of water, <laughs> 11 miles across, yeah. at the narrowest point, uh, yeah. they don't like us. OK. Could, would you let me say something briefly, Mark? If it's going to be intelligent, yeah. OK. Well, I'll be the judge of that. I'm going to... And so will the other listeners. Mark, two quick questions. One, yeah. when you're asked to wear a hard hat with, when, when there's a roof on top of you, why do you think that they want you to wear a hard hat? When there's a roof above my head, I haven't got a clue. Well, there must be some reason, isn't there? Ask, ask, someone, ask someone in Brussels. Could something fall on you, perhaps? Sorry? Could something fall on you? What, the ceiling above my head? Well, I'm asking you. What? What's going to fall above on my head? I don't know. I haven't the... been in the rooms this, that you've this, been this in. This is the problem with this country. Mm. We abide by all these stupid rules right. set up by Brussels, mm. but they make us follow these rules, mm. but not... Off the other European so countries. That was my next question. Have you ever been to Greece? That was my next question. So you're saying when when you're in Greece, they don't obey the rules, is that right? No, don't obey them. <laughs> how, how, much, how much time do you spend when you're on holiday in Greece visiting building sites? Well, to be quite honest, mm. every year I go to Cyprus for my holidays. Mm. Lucky for some, yeah. Yeah, and I, well, I work hard, mate. Mm. I work yeah, I don't begrudge you it. Go on. Right, mm. I'll go to Cyprus, I'll mm. stay in Paphos every year. Yeah. While I'm in Paphos, they built new hotels. Mm. And you see the guys up there working on the hotels, not one hard hat, not one high-vis. <laughs> Plenty of flip-flops, <laughs> but 
but no cold hats or high visions. So, uh, do, you, do you think that that's because the people working in the hotel industry in Pathos are disobeying the laws, or do you think that the EU actually has different laws for the people in Pathos from the people in Lewisham? Well, I think... No, I'm not talking about just Lewisham. I'm mm. talking about England. Yeah, I England as a whole. Health and safety in England mm. has gone mental because of EU regulations, but in Cyprus, they don't seem to care. What, isn't, it a question, it, isn't, isn't it just a question that you're being a good law-abiding citizen, Mark, and the no, people of Pathos are not? being law-abiding... It's the whole structure of the euro. <laughs> You've got one but we're not in the one euro, country, though. One rule for but we're not country. in the euro, Mark. We've got all different rules. Well, last time no I checked, no last time I checked, we, we, we use the we pound. We by the rules, like a load of mugs in this country <laughs> that we really are. We're a load of bleeding <laughs> mugs. We all buy by the rules, yeah. and everyone else goes. We're not playing to the rules. Mm. We don't have to do what you say. We don't have to listen. So just to, to be you. absolutely clear, but you voted. Do. Just you voted to leave the EU because you yes, don't like wearing exactly. hard hats on building sites. Why? Because mm. we are scapegoats for everyone. We just, we just, <laughs> we just a load of mugs in this country. We just treat like rubbish. Don't we? Do you really feel that, Mark? You really yes, feel I that do. strongly? We like we're treated like rubbish in this country. With, I'm a second-rate citizen in my own country. Right. Why don't I feel like that, do you think? Sorry? Why don't I feel like a second-rate citizen in my own Probably country? Probably because you earn a lot more money than me. I bet you I'm not. I bet you do. I bet you I'm not. What's your daily rate? I can't go into that, but I bet you What's get more. I bet you get more a week than I do, Mark. Huh? I bet you get more than I do. I bet I'll do and all. Yeah, exactly. There you go. See, were you, yeah, were you, were you winding me I'm up, Mark? I I'll work hard. Were you winding me up? Are you a Remainer in disguise? No, I'm not a Remainer. In... Do you know what? Do you know that bloke who stands up at Westminster there with a the blue hat, top hat on? Not personally, no. No, no. Well, you've seen him on the news, haven't you, loads of times, haven't you? Mm. I've bawled him out a couple of times about remaining. Why is it so... Why is it? Because we voted out, they mm. can't accept it. Now then, if we vote, if we had a general election mm. and Labour got in, mm. we'd have to accept that, wouldn't we? Accept what? So why can't they accept that we voted out and let's get out? Why can't Jeremy Corbyn accept it? Let's get out. Well, some people have suggested he'd rather like us to be out. Mark, very good to speak to you. Very jealous of your holidays and your high earnings and your work ethic. And I'm very sorry that you have to wear hard hats on building sites. Not quite sure that's a particularly good reason for leaving the EU, but each to their own. Bye, now, please.